I want to welcome everybody who has come in for this conversation. Uh, my name is Adi Jarabi. I'm Movement's Lead at Lang Kelly Chase Foundation. If you have been on Twitter, there is some news <laughs> about Lang Kelly Chase. We have announced our intention to wholly redistribute the assets, the networks, the capital of the foundation over the next five years. So this question of what is ethical investing and what does that look like isn't only a question that is for us, but is a question that we see for all of the communities we are part of and all of the movements we are part of. The basic thing that we're starting this conversation with is really trying to understand the fundamental assumptions that underpin investment and investment strategies, but also doing that with understanding that, as Maurice put it in an earlier session, across the Atlantic, appearing on this, that screen, the point is to change it. The point is to change this space that we're in and this world that we're in and design a better one and design one that is more mutually beneficial, that is more life affirming, that is more human and beyond human. So that's, that's the sort of starting point that we have. I bring some of my own background of sort of, you know, in our earlier conversations, we had a conversation about my own anxieties about finance and investment. And I was like, well, a lot of time people that don't have much money think finance and investment happens over there. They are trying to just get to money. And that is sort of, you know, the survival a lot of people are forced to live with. But also, as a sort of former trade unionist, always a trade unionist, the reference points that I have is we can have organized people, we can organize people, but if we do not organize money, we do not have longevity. So we have to organize people and we have to organize money. And whenever we think there's money for a good cause, if it's not being spent right away, there's a need for investment strategy. If the money is held collectively or privately, whether it's assets of the whole movement or assets of individual organization, we have to have conversations about how do we invest that? How do we spend that? How do we steward that? So with that, I wanted to start with Simon. Logically, we are going in this direction, so the speakers are in order. I'm not gonna give long introductions of each speakers because that's on the bio pack. What I have asked the speakers is to just give their first name and what brings them into this conversation. So Simon, I want to start with you and a question of what does a more ethical investing look like? Where do we start? Thank you very much, Ali. I'm gonna tell you a story about what ethical investing doesn't look like and an investment which went disastrously wrong, spectacularly wrong, um, because I think it's helpful to help us understand what, it, what it investing looks like to get it right. Um, but first, I wanna tell you a little bit about me um, because I, I hope that will be helpful to the story. Um, so since 2000, I've been a financial journalist. I worked for two global um, New York-based news organizations, the most recent of which was the Wall Street Journal, where I broke the story of this huge financial disaster. Um, I've been freelance journalist for the last year. Um, but before I became a journalist in 2000, so in the 1990s, I had two very, for me, important formative experiences. So in 1994, when I was 18, I taught English in northern Pakistan for nine months. Um, so I'm a British Italian. I don't have any family or connections to South Asia or the Middle East. So this was an, a very important experience for me in, culturally and socioeconomically. I'm living in a country where people live by and large, on a dollar a day. Um, so they're poor, or well, that's in, you know, the language and the thinking I had at the time. But they're also great people. They're very resilient, they're very creative, they're very intelligent, they're very smart. Um, anyway, and I had a really extraordinary experience. Two years after that, I taught in a refugee camp in Gaza. Again, very poor people, they got no money but they're intelligent, they're resilient, they're entrepreneurial, and I'm having another great experience. 
Anyway, I didn't study finance, I didn't start economics. In 2000, I started as a financial journalist, and I discover the world of money. Not hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds, but billions and trillions of pounds moving around the fi global financial system across countries and continents, also within countries. So from richer parts of the UK to poorer parts of the UK and back and forth, and the people in the financial markets are obsessing about money because that's their job, to manage financial flows. And it was pretty interesting because I didn't know anything about finance, so central banks, banking, fund management, private equity, how it invests in companies, how it exploits people. You know, it was my job to write about all of this, the good and the bad. The thing that really hit me was that people in the financial world obsess about money and the abundance of money. And they were not at all interested in the absence of money. So they were interested in billions of dollars, but not billions of people, because that wasn't their priority, because there are billions of people who don't have any money. And this struck me as kind of problematic on two levels. One, you know, the world out there has billions of people who have different levels of income. So if we want to understand the world, we need to understand everyone and not just the people who have lots of money. And so problem, this is problematic on just to like, how do we understand the world we're in? And on a second level, this was morally problematic. Like, we're, so, you know, are we just going to ignore people who don't have any money? It doesn't seem very democratic. So anyway, as a journalist, I did my job, and every, I tried to find ways of writing about people and places that didn't have an abundance of money. You know, story by story, discreetly, not trying to annoy my editors, so I got fired. It was a gradual process. Um, you know, one of the first people I wrote about was a former JP Morgan banker who started a micro-loan project in East London. And she was inspired by this professor from Bangladesh who'd done the same Bangladesh. And a year after I wrote their story, he won the Nobel Prize. And he inspired many, many people around the world with how finance can potentially be helpful. It can also be disastrous if it's mismanaged. Microfinance has done good things, it's done bad things. Um, so anyway, financial crisis, 2008, financial system blows up. One response to that was an increased concern about the ethics of finance within the financial system. And one result of that was people coming together to talk about triple bottom line uh, investing, social investing, ethical investing, impact investing was the term that they decided they were going to use. We're all impact investors. And that, to me, seemed like a positive thing and progress because at least people within the financial system were explicitly acknowledging, yes, we need to make profits, but we also really need to have positive social and environmental outcomes too. Those are the, the triple bottom lines, profit, people, planet. And a lot of good has come out of this. Um, but the scandal that I focused on in the last few years and also wrote a book about also came out of this. Now, the, the subject of the scandal was a private firm called Abraj, uh, which was the largest emerging markets investment firm. And it was very, uh, the founder of that firm, a man called Arif Nakvi, was very early into mastering the language of sustainable investing, impact investing. He raised billions of dollars from the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the British government, the American government, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, convincing investors that he could take that money, invest it in companies to provide services in the developing world, in Africa and Asia, and make profits and produce and, and, and end poverty. So he did make some investments which were successful. He raised a billion dollar healthcare fund to buy and build clinics across Africa and Asia. The Gates Foundation put in $100 million. World Bank, British government put in millions as well. Now, the trouble was that as our reporting showed, um, money from this fund and other funds was siphoned off and used for other purposes. So there was, and then after we broke the story in 2018, 
US Department of Justice criminally charged six abroad executives. The founder faces 291 years in jail for a massive fraud and theft. Um, he says he's innocent, his trial hasn't happened yet, his extradition has been ordered. But beneath, so beneath that, with the healthcare fund, there's one issue I want to leave you with. The healthcare fund was a for-profit healthcare fund, and the, profit, and the fund said it could help end health poverty. But in order to have the services of that fund, customers had to pay. And, and the people in Kenya and Nigeria and Pakistan generally couldn't afford to. And if they had been asked, if, they'd been, if people had listened to these people on the ground, like, this company plans to provide these services, the answer would have been immediate. We can't afford it. They were excluded. The primary stakeholders of this fund and this venture were ignored. And this, you know, fraud was perpetrated because in Davos and financial conferences, which are not entirely dissimilar from this, a narrative and a conversation took root that, yeah, this is going to work. But the key people who really mattered were not included. So to conclude, for me, ethical investing includes everyone. And too often in the financial world, I've seen too many people excluded. Thank you, Simon. Over to the Well, um... Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. And I'd like to thank both Bonnie and Steph Brabi for inviting me um, to this really incredible uh, program. Uh, my name is Delilah Rothenberg, and I'm a co-founder and the executive director of a nonprofit called the Pre-Distribution Initiative, or PDI, as we go by for short. Um, and we're focused on supporting investors and their stakeholders in co-creating improved investment structures and investment governance practices that better um, support, uh, better address systemic and systematic risks, including inequality and climate change and biodiversity loss, and that better support the sharing of wealth with workers and communities. Um, we primarily work with institutional investors, and uh, the reason why is because that's my professional background. My education actually was in history, politics, and African studies, and um, I thought I'd work for a nonprofit, but I was really interested in um, not recreating cycles of dependency. And I saw through some volunteer work in Tanzania and through my studies that there was an opportunity to attract capital to small, medium-sized businesses in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's what made me interested in finance. I didn't know anything about finance when I first started. I spent the four, first four years of my career in public equities on the sell side. I was at Bear Stearns during the financial crisis. Um, and then by that time, I realized that I wanted to be in private capital markets because they were more suitable for less liquid markets like sub-Saharan Africa, and I went into private equity infrastructure and project finance. And through that time, I uh, saw a lot of opportunity to do good, but we, we were not attracting capital to small, medium-sized enterprises. They were mostly, mostly larger enterprises, and there was a heavy emphasis on financial materiality in terms of you know, what ESG initiatives or impact investing initiatives can we do that are going to increase the returns from this particular investment, that are going to improve the financial health of this particular investment? And I think that's one of the challenges in institutional investing is, you know, we were, I was working with fund managers, I was working with companies and project developers, and we're given mandates by these large institutional investors like pension funds and insurance companies and sovereign wealth funds and endowments, and they interpret their fiduciary duty as often maximizing financial return. And that's not actually what fiduciary duty needs to be. It, uh, for a pension fund, is you know, the duty of loyalty, prudence, and care, and um, being able to pay for their pensioners' pensions. It's intergenerational fiduciary duty, too. It's not just their pensioners today, but it's their pensioners you know, decades out. And when you think about the... Um, these large investors like pension funds or insurance companies or sovereign wealth funds portfolios, they're very diversified. They're exposed to every industry and every geography and every asset class. And so if they're investing in investments that produce extern negative externalities, like inequality and climate change and biodiversity loss, then we're not going to have a healthy um, environment or a healthy social fabric 
um, which underpins the markets and their diversified portfolios. And so there's actually a case to be made for these large institutional investors to embrace not just single financial materiality, as some of you might be familiar with, or this you know, risk and return of each individual company and the near-term financials of that company, but longer-term systemic materiality in terms of um, you know, making sure that they're, that they're um, accounting for and integrating into their financial analysis and decision-making what are negative externalities, rethinking risk and value. And so for those investors who might find it difficult to talk about ethics, there actually is a financial case to be made in that context for thinking about the health of human and natural systems. And that's something that we're very focused on at the pre-distribution initiative. Um, I, I really, you know, saw these issues firsthand when investing in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and seeing that the distribution of risk and return was so skewed, so much return is extracted out of the continent. Um, and workers and communities, in the case of real assets in particular, create a lot of um, value and they take on a lot of risk. And that's not accounted for in financial analysis and decision making. So we're working on co-creating together with affected stakeholders tools to support investors in changing these practices. Um, similarly, you know, I'll say in terms of financial materiality, a lot of investors into private equity funds are looking at the uh, risk and return profile of that particular fund based on the underlying investments. But the investors into those funds are not necessarily looking at how is that fund manager structured. Fund manager compensation for their executives, for the mega fund managers, is often way higher than corporate executive compensation, way higher than you know the CEOs of the large bulge bracket global banks. Um, and if you look at the pay ratio, some of these pay ratios are over between the you know, workers in the portfolio companies and the executives of these private equity fund managers. We're looking at over 1,000 times. That's not accounted for when we're thinking about you know, the, an, analyzing the, the underlying companies and the funds. We're not looking at the overall fund manager, so that needs to be taken into account. But I'll, I'll stop there in terms of, you know, um, I, I would love to hear from our colleagues, um, but maybe talk about the solutions a bit more as we progress in the conversation. Yeah, we're definitely going to come back to the actions that we want people in this room to take and sort of, you know, whether that's a starting a conversation or whether that's something far more substantive. So for me, one of the early interesting points has been the sort of amazing internationalism of what you two of you brought in terms of the story, but also the story of where the investments are, where the assets are, and what is coming back. So I, with that, I wanted to go to somebody who's looking at that more complicated question in a philanthropic organization, an organization that is based on very high ambitions and very higher purpose for all of us. So yeah, opportunity. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'll give you a perspective um, from an investment um, uh, practitioner's eyes. Um, I've been investing for the last two decades and I've been working at asset managers, large and small, I've been working at asset owners. And the, the last decade um, has, has really made me think about um, and has allowed me to find ways and means of harnessing capital to bring about positive change for people on the planet. It's not, a, it's, it's not an easy process. But I think if we can um, enable ourselves to try and experiment, we really make some small differences. And if you add those up, they can make huge, profound differences. So for the last five and a half years, I've been working at a foundation, Guys and St. Thomas's Foundation, one of the um, sponsors of the event. Uh, we're a health foundation with a mission to uh, support and sustain a healthier society for everybody. We're based in London. We do a lot of work, uh, localised work, uh, in and around the boroughs of Lambeth and Southwark. So do come and visit us if, if uh, you would like to learn more uh, about this. We have a substantial spend programme. So when, Ali, you talk about philanthropy, um, our grant-making philanthropy spend work is, is, is done in those boroughs, but also beyond, where we focus on trying to improve uh, the lives and, and um, well-being of some of the most deprived and underserved and unmet needs uh, in the population. 
beyond the spend, though, in the last few years, we have been thinking about our investments. So we have a significant endowment, uh, quite sizable uh, compared to many foundations in the UK. We are stewards of that, and so it is very important that when we're investing, we think about uh, our responsibilities as well, not for just for the present, but also for, uh, for, for, for the future. So as an endowed foundation, guys in St. Thomas's, we, we were early adopters uh, of setting a dual objective of market returns alongside uh, impact. And the way we think about health uh, impact is, is through uh, a mission alignment lens, so about health impact. Um, this journey started in 2018 as an experiment where our uh, board members provided us with a small mandate to just start experimenting with our impact investing strategy. And um, this is something we have been developing um, and uh, growing over the years. We're making fund investments in this, uh, with this particular allocation um, in order to uh, try and improve health. And the way we think about health is not just through traditional health care, but also the key determinants of health. Because as a, as a, as a health foundation, we know that places where people are born, where they live, grow up, where they work, age, all of these things have a profound impact uh, on our health. Um, today, that particular strategy is 10% uh, of the endowment, and uh, we're still making investments, but it is across uh, asset classes and across sectors. And we're already seeing um, significant, profound impact, life-changing impact, uh, for, for people and communities, those end beneficiaries. And uh, that is uh, through providing good quality, safe, uh, affordable housing for some of the most vulnerable in society, those that are in temporary bread and breakfast accommodation and not really having stability in their homes, women who are fleeing persecution, um, and also um, some of the most uh, needy in society. Uh, on the other flip side, we're also making investments that are enabling uh, and empowering consumer populations in developed markets, but also in emerging markets, giving them the tools and, the, uh, and access to uh, products and services that are going to improve their health and well-being. Um, so that's our impact investing strategy, and I mentioned it's 10% of our overall endowment. It doesn't stop there. The impact and the footprint that we want to achieve pervades throughout the whole of the endowment because I mentioned um, that we have a dual objective across the, uh, the whole portfolio. So it's important to um, uh, recognize ways and means that we can start to make change and different uh, differences. And that is also through engagement. That is also through how we do our evaluation analysis and due diligence of the investments that we're making, having regular dialogues with the people, the, the managers that we're uh, entrusting our capital to um, and what they're doing with that capital, but not just providing the capital and then leaving them be, but, but ensuring that we are uh, in regular touch and understanding what is the change that we've entrusted them to make. Um, so we also have uh, commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion. We have commitments to climate change, um, also uh, net zero. Um, we have got thematic strategies that we are also employing in, in the um, broader endowment. Um, so so the, the way that I think about it is we've got to make small steps in order to get to bigger, larger change. So much. Thank you. Uh, last not but not least, Bonnie, I'm going to come to you and then we're going to start having some questions. We had asked whether it is possible for the audience to ask a question. I can see there's a mic, so if somebody, by the time Bonnie finishes, let me know if the mic works. If there's time, we're going to come to the audience because for me, this is a conversation that all of us have to be in, not a conversation Davos style that happens behind closed doors and series of people having conversations. So, yeah, over to Bonnie. 
Well, um, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Bonnie, and I see that we kind of messed up the, the slide. So I was supposed to be <laughs> chair, but um, Ali and I changed roles. Um, uh, so on on this topic of ethics of investing, um, as the speakers were talking, um, I decided to like say something else. Um, but I've been thinking actually about this topic unconsciously, I would say, since five years old, which feels quite early, maybe too early. Um, so in 1997, as uh, so I was five, uh, it was the Asian financial crisis. Um, so uh, I grew up in Hong Kong, um, and, you know, we... that. When I was five, that was also the time when I needed to go to primary school. So my parents decided to buy a flat uh, right before the financial crisis. You know, they didn't see it coming um, in this great catchment area. Um, and a few months after, um, that property collapsed in prices like everything else uh, by two thirds. So they took up a mortgage on something that is, you know, of much higher value than it was. So uh, I got to learn about this concept of negative equity, that there could be people who actually have negative net worth. Um, and I remember we had to share one breakfast as a family. When I tell the story to my husband, he's like, why do you still go out for breakfast? I'm like, well, that's what people do in Hong Kong. But you know, we were in quite difficult times um, financially, and I think that left an imprint on me. Um, and I have been reflecting, I mean, now my daughter turning two, and we are also needing to go through that journey, you know, try to get to a place, uh, try to buy a property or rent a place in a good catchment area. But as that, so we've been thinking about it in the past few months, and as that process unfolded, I just realized that there was something in me, and it must be financial trauma from, you know, when I was really young. Um, and I think the ethics of investing really needs to go back to that individual. You know, I was the so-called victim of this huge financial system. And why, why were there asset bubbles in the first place? Why is housing financialized and being speculated upon? Why, why did my parents then manage to turn things around, right, for them? Um, they were lucky enough that they had a second chance because the housing prices collapsed again after a few years. They were able to buy one property at low price, which helped them go back up. But that shouldn't have happened. Like I, so I think kind of this ethics of investing, you know, when we are thinking about huge asset owners, market rate return, what does that actually mean for that? individual who don't have voice and who don't have power in the current system. And I also think a lot of impact investing, um, so I've been working in impact investing for the past 10 years because I feel there must be a way to unlock much larger sums of capital for social impact. But what I haven't heard at all actually in impact investing conferences is the how of investing. It's not just the what, you know, we can invest in different issues and try to create positive impact, but the whole investment process is still replicating the traditional kind of mainstream investments. Um, and so I've been fortunate enough to work with different people in the room, um, Rana from Equality Impact Investing Project, you know, we're trying to get investors to really think about power in the investment process and why they are shifting disproportionate return, well, risk to the investees. Um, and with Good Ancestors Movement, one of the uh, curators or partners as well, we're currently working with wealth holders who want to dedicate their capital to more regenerative investments, very much like what you heard earlier today uh, with Catali. So I think they are bright spots, um, but we have to make sure we keep challenging ourselves and we have to make sure that we never forget the human uh, in all these investment jargons. Thank you so much. I have a correction to make continuously on that one uh, that I, have, I no longer work at Joseph Rantry Charitable Trust. <laughs> I did not see behind me. If you want to talk to my colleagues at JRCTX colleagues, Tim and Sophie, hands up, are here, uh, as well as some extra C's. Hello. Uh, so yeah, so that. I will, I have asked if the mic can be, yeah? 
Yeah, absolutely. Any questions? Any reflections? I think we have. If it's possible, I'm going to take two or three in one go, because I don't think we're going to have multiple goes, and then we can go through the audience. Hi, uh, my name's Anna, I work for UK Youth. Um, one of my questions is, so a lot of you have touched on how to use investment for impact or for social good. And I think, Bonnie, you mentioned this a bit, but I'd be more curious about also your thoughts about investment as a tool in itself and the ethicality of using investment of a tool of impact. Like, how do you see the ethics of the financial system as a whole and the ingrained power dynamics in it? And how do you think that goes with kind of using it as a tool for good? Or is that something that needs to be dismantled in, in a wider sense? Be really curious of your thoughts. Thank you so much. And thank you for modeling a concise question. Any more questions? <laughs> You know, oh, sorry, up in a balcony. I don't know whether we can get it. I think I have quite a loud voice. <laughs> I will repeat it after you. I would like to ask about when you talk about ethical investing and you have the double standard of, say, in healthcare, using, during the privatisation of the NHS, mm -hmm. using profits made mm -hmm. to then do good works. I, I, I don't, I don't, I can't fathom the word ethical with that type of investing. It's a little bit like when we talk about understanding why we're, we're pulling people out of the river to save them and not asking ourselves, why are they jumping in the river? So when we talk about ethical yeah. investing, how on earth can we marry up the thinking around ripping off the people, so to speak, and then giving a little bit back with a pat on the head? Thank you. If somebody could let me know if the audience online caught that question, but essentially if I may summarize it, what are the ethics of investing in private entities when we are looking at taking the money out in order to use in charitable means? Where in case of in the UK, in NHS, that could be a public institution. So yeah. One more question, if we have the back, yeah, Jesus. Hi, thanks so much. Um, uh, uh, Delilah, you touched on it a little bit, but I'd be really interested in the panel's view on how you feel it is working with larger financial institutions. I mean, Simon, you talked about it as well. There's a huge amount of kind of... Um, the huge, huge issues, right, in large financial institutions. On one side, you've got asset managers who are saying good things. On the other side, you've got investment banking teams who are funding climate, you know, massively kind of fossil fuels or, or climate problematic kind of projects and things like that. I just wonder how you recommend people kind of find their way through that. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have a five minutes notice. So I will add one more question to it and then throw it back into the mixer, which is like, you know, as a, as a trade unionist, I'm a skeptic of organized money and its willingness to reform the world in ways that benefit all of us. To go back to the Simon's way, billions of people that do not have money. So what is in terms of looking at actions and looking at conversations that we can take out of this room in order to be more democratic? What is an elephant in the room that people should be talking about? To come back to those two questions as well. Yeah. Should we go round, but very quickly, because sure, uh, we have five minutes. I'd yeah. like to uh, address your question about private health care. So the private equity firm, which collapsed in a massive fraud and scandal, accused of theft, a barge, owned, as I said, it had a billion dollar health care fund, which was supposed to buy and build hospitals and clinics. One of the hospitals which it owned was in Kenya. It was called the Nairobi Women's Hospital. And um, last month, Oxfam published an excellent investigative report called Sick Development, which showed how patients of the Nairobi Women's Hospital had been locked up because they couldn't afford to pay their bills. 
uh, you know, dead bodies were kept from relatives for months. You know, there's news reports of like young children being kept because because the patients couldn't afford to pay or their relatives couldn't afford to pay. And if they were paying like for maternal health or childbirth, sometimes they were paying, you know, a, a year's income or multiple years income. Um, so for me, maybe private healthcare can play a role, but it's a very constrained and it's certainly not in providing universal healthcare. The NHS is the model. And if you want to be an, an ethical investor in that context, then the ethical thing to do is for investors to pay their taxes so the taxes can be used to fund universal free healthcare and education. So why have we got to a place where we talk about these things and it looks like the private sector is trying to take over public provision? And that there is a role for private sector, but it's not universal to finish is because I think we need to be very vigilant that this new language of ethical finance, impact investing, AESG, it is a positive time, a thousand flowers are blooming in terms of ideas, but this language can also be used as a veil for, 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 for unethical behavior, for misconduct. So we need to like ask investors, you say this, show me. And by the way, what are the terms? How much are you earning out of this? Would be a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the big problems when it comes to uh, institutional investors is that they often have the investment teams that are doing the investments who are incentivized one way, and that's often to meet or exceed a historical financial benchmark that does not account for externalities, negative externalities or positive externalities. Um, and then you have the stewardship or ESG teams or increasingly impact teams who are engaging with the portfolio companies saying, you know, treat your workers better and, you know, offer better products and services and operate more responsibly. But if you have the investment teams over here that are engaging with the, um, their counterparts in an asset manager or the CEO and the CFO and the investor relations person at a company, and they're saying we need you to maximize your financial return and take on more debt um, to magnify your equity returns or to get, you know, you know, nice high yield um, bond or, you know, some, some kind of leveraged loan. I mean, look at Thames Water, right? They were overloaded with debt and didn't have the resources that they needed to do what they're, they were supposed to do, their social mission, right? Um, so, you know, we're not having enough conversations about the capital structures of companies, about the structures of funds, and that's really, and, and in order to, to get an institutional investors to pay attention to this stuff, you really have to talk to them about, you know, talk to their investment teams, talk to their chief investment officer, so that's what we're trying to do. So, thank you, Delilah. We have two minutes, so I'm gonna go one minute each and then encourage you to carry on this conversation over lunch, as is the way. Me too. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I agree with everything that's been said, um, that it's very important to do thorough due diligence as an investor. Uh, you know, there are, uh, think about fiduciary responsibilities also being, making sure that you are thorough um, and that you stay close to your investments, um, that you just don't leave them in the pot and then go back 10 years later to see what the results are. It is an ongoing, continuous dialogue, and sometimes you have to ask some very difficult questions of um, the managers that you invest in or the companies that you invest in. I would also say, if we think about the global context, we're not just talking about public systems, public health systems. It is also, uh, there is also a large uh, private health system, just to answer your question. And so it is important to make sure that we continue making investments to support and sustain people who do not have access to public health care. Well, I don't have too much to add. I, I do think we should keep asking really hard questions and I think the impact investing space um, suffers from self, kind of a lot of celebration, self-celebration and patting ourselves on the back. I think it's really only in this conference that I had the courage to propose this panel where we are asking quite uncomfortable questions. But how can we leave that space for more people like Simon with the investigative work that he's done so brilliantly to help us challenge our 
deep assumptions. Um, and I think we have to look at ownership and governance uh, and investment processes. And we have to we have to also change from our fixation on market rate return because, and I'll leave with this thought, why do we stick to our expectation of market rate return when our planet is burning and we live in an unprecedented level, levels of inequality? Thank you all. Thank you to the panel for all your contributions. Thank you to people in here to people who are joined online, and I sort of urge you to go back to that point. The point is to change it. This is not a, this is an isolated conversation as long as we make it remain isolated conversation. If we bring it back to the work in all of the different places we're in, we're gonna make difference where we are. Thank you. <laughs>